Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone to Friday Night Live. I'm your host, Abdullah Wahid. And inshallah, tonight we'll have some special guest, Brother Umar Isa, from all the way from England. Inshallah, he'll be joining us. Uh, he does not need any introduction. And Sheikh Rami, all the way from California. For us, that's a distance also. We're based out of Michigan. And he'll be joining us. And we are so blessed to have such great people with us tonight. I want to welcome everyone that is um, checking in to our our live on YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram. Welcome everyone in Mufti Abdul Wahab. May Allah protect him, preserve him. He is also with us uh, listening and uh, paying attention and making sure that I do my job. And inshallah, through my words, I hope I can give him some comfort and motivation. I know all of us, all of you brothers and sisters have, have been uh, following our family very closely um, after the tragic loss of our beloved brother, Sheikh Abdul Rahim, rahmatullah alayhi. Uh, brothers and sisters, keep us in your du'as. We are uh, definitely, you know, we've, we are trying to, uh, are trying our best to stand back up on our feet and get back into the world. And it's, alhamdulillah, things have progressed and the right on, on uh, you know, uh, upwards, and we we are we have no choice but to get back up, like the words of uh, Aisha the Allah wa Anha. لقد نزل بأبي لو نزل بالجبال الراسية لها ضها. Aisha the Allah wa Anha says the the burden that was put on my father Abu Bakr the Allah wa Anha after the demise of the Prophet sallam, if it was to be if that burden was to be put onto mountains, it would put it would make the mountains go into dust. That was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. This is why. One day, Abu 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 Ali radiallahu an Ali radiallahu an was giving khutbah, and he said something very strange, which caught the attention of Abu Huraira in the speech. He, he said, "Laula an Abu Bakr ustukhlifa ma abid Allah." If Abu Bakr Siddiq did not become the Khalifa, the 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 you know the the leader who took over the responsibility of the Ummah after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, um, there would not be anyone worshiping Allah. The Islam would perish. And then he said it, and then Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says, Mah, like what are you saying? How, that's a bold statement. And he says the same thing. Laula anna Abu Bakr ustukhlifa ma'abidullah. If Abu Bakr did not become the next leader after the Prophet sallam, we would have so much uh, deficiency in our, in, our, in our faith, in our practice, in our growth. And he said this three times, and he said, because the way Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was able to come back from such loss, and and to after such uh, grief and anxiety, where the world was completely, you know, it was de- the the morale, the, the the you know the the energy was literally was it was sucked out of the ummah, and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was able to stand back up and help others stand back up, and that's what we need to do. You brothers and sisters who are watching us are giving us that strength by your prayers, uh, by your kind words. And, uh, you know, it's different. Somebody asked me the other day, if you meet someone that loses a near relative, will you tell them to be patient only? I said to them, that would be hard. I, I, I just, now when I hear that someone loses a relative, or even on social media or message comes to me that someone passed away, it, it's, it just sets indifferent now. It, it's totally different. All my life, I looked at like, you know, someone dies. Inna lillahi wa inna You know, may Allah, you know, forgive him or her and, re- and give the family sabr. That's how we text people back. Inna lillahi ma'ata. Inna lillahi ma'akhad wa lahu ma'ata. Wa kullu shayin indahu bi ajlim musamma. Fal yasbir wal tahtasib. You know, we, 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 we say words where we just comfort people in text. But subhanallah, brothers and sisters, sometimes to just pause your world and feel what another person is going through and such loss. I, 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 I could not relate to it. I, I could not relate to it. I'm not grateful that I can relate to it. I wish I still never had to go through this experience. But this is life. Life is going to teach us so many lessons. Sometimes through joy, sometimes through pain. And, and I wish growing up, I was told that the world is full of pain too. And if there was a but at the same time, there's so much good in the world, you know, and uh, we're so blessed looking at all the stories of the prophets and and the companions. 
our, we're so blessed to be Muslims and healthy and all the things that we have around. So we are never going to be ungrateful for the situation we're in. Um, obviously, it's a uh, it's still fresh, and uh, and I really I hope we can, you know, bring some positivity through this pain to the ummah, and. Uh, we don't know how long we're here for. We just want to make sure that our stay in this world is productive. It's done in a manner that's most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, those who are listening around their family members, we want to make sure we're in the best form with them. We, we treat them well. We hold them tight. Um, not knowing when we're going to see them again. Uh, the Sunday before my brother passed away was a Sunday night. I taught at Miftah, and my brother was in the in the in the in the auditorium there. And I came up to him, made a small joke like an older brother does to a small younger brother, a baby brother. And you know, that was my last exchange. It was it was soft, but it was a little sarcastic nudge. We smiled, you know. Just it was a pleasant feel, and then. The next time I met him is when I opened his bag and his eyes were closed. It was. And as I was, you know, accepting that he is leaving me, I told myself that, you know, we're going to meet in Jannah, at the door of Jannah. We're gonna, that's, that's our next stop. We have, that's our next stop. That's the only way that I'm comforted. And I want you to know that too. Your parents, who, for those who have lost their parents, you know, we have some people that I know here who have lost their fathers and their mothers and who have lost their loved ones. It's not over. You know, it, that that day of judgment is so special for people. So special. It's nothing to run away from, nothing to fear. It's a special moment. Imagine when you can meet everyone again. And inshallah, you are righteous enough that Allah will bring you under his shade and you are gathered in the company of the prophets, alayhim sallallahu alayhi wa so uh, Abdul Rahim Rahmatullahi has taught this older brother, this his oldest brother, the greatest lesson of life. All my life I was teaching him. All my life I was instructing him. All my life I was, you know, making sure he doesn't fall or slip and making sure he came out to be this young man that I was so proud of. Um, playing the father role, older brother role, it's amazing. This young baby brother of mine has impacted me so much, impacted all of us, my brothers, that I just, 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 I'm so humbled to learn from someone so younger, so much younger than me, so much from him. And I continue that I believe that I think his death was the greatest teacher for me, the greatest teacher, honestly. Like I've gone through so many teachers, but his loss is, has been n not emotionally, I'm talking real, like has been the greatest teacher for me and my brothers. And what greater teacher and what greater lesson could be that our eyes on the prize now. We were always looking at the prize, which is akhirah, but it's laser focus, laser focus. Inshallah, we ask Allah to keep it focused. Um, I want to welcome everyone again. You guys have been so kind, so gracious with us. With all, like I said, all your words, all your friends, brothers and sisters, it's like a family, honestly. People have been messaging us, calling us, telling us, we felt the pain like it was one of ours. Some people said that we've never met him. And uh, we heard about him through people. And they're expressing their pain. SubhanAllah, he, he was just that personality. And a lot of the pain that you guys are going through, all the love that you're giving, it's really the, 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 you know, the love that you have for Islam and that we have through the, 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 through the medium of Islam. We love each other for the sake of Islam and Allah. We're brothers and sisters who are family. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this purely for his sake. And that is the way a Muslims are supposed to react to other Muslims' pain. You know, we're like jasad in wahid. You know, we're like one family and can we have the same pain for others? Imagine the pain of the Prophet sallallahu watching each one of his companions go through so much suffering and so much pain and he was able to help them. But again, I really appreciate it. My family really appreciates him. Keep on praying for Abdul Rahim rahmatullahi we believe and know for sure that he's in a better place, but he's not left us in a better place. It's it's our our house. You know, the other day, 
I was walking around and my brothers were doing all these different things just a couple of days ago and I screamed. I said, yeah, Abdul Rahim. I screamed. And, and, and I told my brothers and my mom, and I think one of my brothers was praying. I'm very demanding as a personality. Like I want someone around me all the time. If I come in the house, I want a brother to give me attention. My mom is not feeling well, so she's not giving me the same attention. You know, just like that's my personality. Abdul Rahim was that person for me. Rahmatullahi. I would walk in and say, Bajan, what's going on? You give me attention, full attention. I never felt, you know, someone gave you love, affection, and absence. It's just, it's difficult. There was a small project in the house that someone did, some of, you know, some friends and some students, one of the brother-in-laws here. And they did it and something happened. And after that, I just had tears in my eyes. I said, if Abdul Rahim did it, he would do it with ihsan, with excellence. He would do it better. So every time there is a lack of something in the house and someone else does it, but they do it wrong, my mind just goes back and it just reminds me of Abdul Rahim because he would just do it different and better. It's like every time I, I told my brothers that and anything that's done without excellence, it reminds me back to my brother because I know how he would do it with so much love and so much care, with so much ihsan. So it's just... It's just hard, brothers and sisters, looking everywhere in the house. Today was the first time I went in the backyard of my mom's house after one month plus one. Like I'm not, I can't go in the backyard because that's where I walked with him for so many years. Threw the football around. Um, just every inch of the backyard is Abdul Rahim for me. It's, it is, but that's why we have to buckle up. Strap up for Jannah. We have to, inshallah. So brothers and sisters, this reminder is for you, for me, for my family. We're, we have to stay. And when I say strapped, I'm not talking about the gun here. I'm talking about strapped up for amal. You know, we're strapped up for good deeds. And, you know, we're ready to go to in the next level of our akhirah. In our dunya, we want to make it, we want to make our intentions firm. Whatever we earn, whatever education we earn, all of this is for the cause of Islam, inshallah. We are excited, brothers and sisters, for Brother Omar Isa with us. Abdul Rahim, rahmatullahi loved Brother Omar Isa also. Um, you know, we had um, uh, Tariq, Muhammad Tariq with us uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, he loved him also. And he uh, loved Brother Omar Isa. His, he loved his voice. Uh, I remember Brother Omar Isa came down to Michigan, and he visited us here. And uh, Brother Abdul Rahim, all of the family members were so happy for his visit. And, and it was, he's so special. And uh, again, uh, these young talent the voices uh, remind me of my brother. Welcome, Brother Omar Isa. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my brother. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Alhamdulillah. 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 Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking out the time so late in your in your country. Uh, Jazakallah for uh, inviting me. Uh, first, my brother, I want to say, like, uh, I found out today about your brother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give a beautiful brother, Jatir uh, Firdos. Ameen. May Allah mm -hmm. SWT make it easy for you and your family. I mean, I can't um, imagine what you're going through. The only way that I can relate is that my father passed away uh, last year. And, uh, you know, we remember him like he was here yesterday, every day. So I'm with you on that kind of the loss. Uh, but when it's, your, when it's your younger brother, I, I, I have not experienced that. And may Allah SWT give you the strength you need in your family. I mean, I mean. May Allah SWT give your father Jannah the Firdos. I mean, you know, absolutely. and I know I can imagine how close you were to your father, and um, yeah. I mean, so you know, I know as a son, if, you know, you have this special relationship with your dad. He's your friend. He's your dad, and then yeah. there's no, there's no way that there's only one father. You know, exactly. There's no, mother. there's no one else. Like I mean, uncles there, but there's only one dad and there's only one mother. And I, I can't imagine what you've gone through. And inshallah, you know, we all are united with our loved ones in Jannah. Inshallah. Inshallah. I mean. Jazakallah. I'm going to step away and inshallah, time to time, if I feel good, I might join you, inshallah, just to sing around with you, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. So, Bismillah ar um, First of all, I'm going to do um, an issue that she dedicated to our brother who passed away and also to my father as well. Anybody who's watching who's uh, lost a love, I'll give them all Jannah for doors. And this nasheed is called um, Dunya Ke Eh Musafir. It's an Urdu nasheed. Here goes Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dunya Ke Eh 
منزل تیری قبر ہے دنیا کے ہیں مسافر منزل تیری قبر ہے تے کر رہا ہے جو تو دو دن کا یہ سفر ہے تے کر رہا ہے جو تو دو دن کا یہ سفر ہے دنیا بنی ہے جب سے لاکھوں کروڑ آئے لاکھوں کروڑ آئے دنیا بنی ہے جب سے لاکھوں کروڑ آئے لاکھوں کروڑ آئے باقی رہا نہ کوئی مٹی میں سب سما ہے مٹی میں سب سما ہے باقی رہا نہ کوئی مٹی میں سب سما ہے میٹی میں سب سمائے اس بات کو نہ بولو اس بات کو نہ بولو سب کا یہی حشر ہے سب کا یہی حشر ہے آنکھوں سے تو نے اپنے کتنے جنازے دیکھے کتنے جنازے دیکھے آنکھوں سے تو نے اپنے کتنے جنازے دیکھے کتنے جنازے دیکھے ہاتھوں سے تو نے اپنے بفنا کتنے مردے دفنا یہ کتنے مردے ہاتھوں سے تو نے اپنے دفنا یہ کتنے مردے دفنا یہ کتنے مردے دنیا کے ہے مسافر دنیا کے ہے مسافر منزل تیری قبر ہے منزل تیری قبر ہے that one nasheed that you just recited was uh my brother one of my, his one of his favorite it, it could be top four or, uh, i think most people attest to that that was one of his favorite i don't know my brother talked about a death and uh you know the transitory life of this world so it was so close to him mm-hmm. and uh you know he he sang this farewell uh uh i know like more of like a with a farewell poem before he went overseas 
that he, it was something that he thought of as a 20 year old, 22 year old, very often. And uh, I, I continue to say this man wasn't really set, settled in this dunya. He, was, he wasn't made for this dunya. It was just like a product that was made to come here to give us some joy and then leave us and teach us how to deal with pain. It just, it was that personality. He loved this poem. Jazakallah khair so much. Um, you know, when you were singing, there was a little static coming uh, at time to time. I don't know okay. what it was. Like, it could be maybe uh, maybe is it is it could it be my headphones maybe my my yeah 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 it could be your headphones could be um, um I think it, shall I shall I shall I take it out and I can use the the microphone on the phone maybe would that be a shall I try that let's let's try that let's try that okay. um let me just uh, let me just take it off then yeah I'm not the most uh, technical guy one second let me see okay, how I'm, I turn I'm this move, uh, yeah. off. I'm gonna move you off for a second you can go ahead and um figure out the headphones because i did know there was a small static and his voice is so good and and people want to hear uh the voice but uh, if there is this not a big problem but again i was telling brother omar isa if he's ready i can bring it back on um his his um his voice is so powerful he read it from the heart i got you back on brother omar. can you can you hear me now is it better can you speak a little bit can you hear me can you hear me I can hear you, but there's still a little static. I don't know where it's coming from. Um, but it's okay. Why don't I? Why don't you take me off again? Why don't, why don't you take me off again? I'll I'll come off and I'll come back on again. I, I think we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. If you're not touching the device, I think we're fine. I think I can hear the static as well, though. You know the kind of thing you're talking about, the static. It might be the connection. Yeah. So let me let me come off and I'll come back on straight away. Okay. Okay. No problem. So let me let me take you off. All right. Perfect. Yeah, brothers. Um, in the meantime, um, I would I, I I can't sing, you know, and I can't entertain you like Brother Omar Isa. But again, he, the poem for those who didn't understand uh, Urdu, it was basically uh, talking to the human being who is a traveler in this world, and uh, telling him or her that. We are travelers in our in our final destination. In this world is the grave. Uh, the longest address that someone keeps in this world is the address where they're buried. We move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood and one city to another city, one house to another house. But there's one place that once you move, there is no moving until وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ عَلِمَتْ نَفْسٌ مَا أَحْضَرَتْ Right? Um, is when we are uh, put into our grave. It's when we're placed in that grave. That address is permanent. Um, what, um, seasons go by, ages go by, generations go by. That address remains. It's an unbelievable address. And that's what the poem was saying, preparing for that direction, that destination, and uh, that grave where we at, were asked by Allah. Brother Umar is back. Let me um enjoy bring him back. Is it is it better now? It's better. You look better too for some reason. Thank you. <laughs> the <line>. um, <laughs> uh, if the static comes here and there, there's no problem. We can ignore it. Please go ahead. We will let you. We, we want to give you your time. Bismillah. Okay, Bismillah. Um, so this nasheed, my brothers and sisters, is um, I'm a nasheed I uh, recite all the time, um, and it's quite um important in this situation because no matter what we go through in life. Um, that could be loss of life, that could be losing a job, or um, you know, not you know, financially being at loss. We should always say Alhamdulillah for everything, uh, because we know that our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the most tested, and he's the the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa taala. So who are we, you know? So this is called Alhamdulillah, and here goes Bismillah ar -Rahim. Everything I have. Everything I own, everything I eat, is thanks to you. Every breath I take, every smile I see, every bird I hear, is thanks to you. Alhamdulillah, 
Every drop of rain is a mercy from above. Every ray of sun is thanks to you. Every ray of sun, the light of the moon, the wind when it blows, it's thanks to you. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. All thanks is to Allah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. All oh, thanks is to Allah. Everything is thanks to you, Allah. All oh, praises are for you. Everything is thanks to you, Allah. Everything is thanks to you, Allah. All oh, praises are for you. Everything is thanks to you, Allah. Alhamdulillah, 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 all thanks is to Allah. Everything is thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our King, our Master, our Majesty, Alhamdulillah. Um, so I don't know if I should go straight into my next sheet, inshallah. Um, so okay, I think I will go into uh, my next sheet straight away, inshallah. This is a um, an Urdu one again. Um, this is basically called um, Rab, and it's based here on the sheet I wrote. And again, Simon Rodden says Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guided me back to Islam in two thousand and eleven, and I used to be an R and B pop singer. If uh, some of you may not know who I am, and um, but I used to be. In the height of Jahaliyyah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for my past, ameen. But I was guided back to this beautiful religion of Islam. And now my content is always about my king, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or his beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is his called Rab, and it's an Urdu one. And here goes, Bismillah ar-Rahim. Har saasa uski, uski meri jaan, Rab ka mujh par. बहुत है एहसान हर सांस उसकी उसकी मेरी जान रब का मुझ पर बहुत है एहसान कैसे उसे ही भूल जाऊं जिंदगी भर रब को चाहूं रब को याद करो रब को याद करो रब को याद करो दिन रात याद करो रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा दिन रात याद करा यह रब सीढ़ी रहा दिखा दे यार अब मुझे अपना बना ले सोता हूँ जब जब जागता हूँ यही दुआ बस मांगता हूँ कैसे उसे ही बोल जाऊँ रब्बा मुझे माँ कर दे रब को याद करो रब को याद करो 
रब को याद करो दिन रात याद करो रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा दिन रात याद करा रब वे सोने सच्चा सहारा तो रब वे सोने सच्चा सहारा तो रब वे सोने सब तो प्यारा तो रब वे सोने सब तो प्यारा तो रब को याद करो रब को याद करो रब को याद करो दिन रात याद करो रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा रब नो याद करा दिन रात याद करा Everything again is thanks to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala our king our master our majesty alhamdulillah mashallah i don't want to stop you please do inshallah another one because when i when i when i interfere time goes by please we're enjoying your beautiful voice and your your lyrics thank you keep on going bismillah alhamdulillah um so this next sheet is basically um the last one i'll be doing tonight it's basically called astaghfirullah and uh, you know my brothers and sisters is very important that we are constantly keeping this zikr on our tongue and you know asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the transgressions we commit on a daily basis me myself i want to expose my sins but every day i i make errors all the time and i'm always asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me you know i always ask myself and i always talk to allah and I say oh allah um am i a good son am i a good husband am i a good father am i a good brother am i a good uncle am i a good friend and you know i i feel that i fail a lot you know and i'm just being honest here and i always ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me please don't think that we are some kind of perfect individuals when we're not we never will be because the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the only the perfect human ever right and we're just trying and i'm just trying so this machine is called a stuck for allah and here goes bismillah ar rahman i've been waiting i've been hurting Cause I've been falling I need your help My heart is breaking So tired of crying Lord I'm calling I need your help I don't want to fight no more I don't want to fight this war Oh na na Oh na na oh na 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 I don't want to fight no more I don't want to fight this war Oh na na oh na na I stop fear of love Ah ah Forgive me, Allah. Ah, 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 ah. I'm so broken. My wounds are open. My life is frozen. I need your help. Cause people always let me down. I'm losing all my air right now. I'm suffocating I my drown. I need your help. I don't want to fight no more. I don't want to fight this war. Oh na na, oh na na, oh na na na. I don't want to fight no more. I don't want to fight this war. Oh na na oh na na yeah I'll stop for Allah ah 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 forgive me Allah ah 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 
I don't wanna fight anymore. I don't wanna run anymore. Forgive me, my king. Forgive me, my Lola. I don't wanna fight anymore. I stop feeling alone. Ah, 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 ah. Forgive me, alone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Amen. Um, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be better moments. Amen. I mean, Brother Omar, thank you so much. Where are you located right now? Where are you sitting? In what city? I'm in London. So I live in yeah. London, UK. London, mashallah. And uh, we asked you last time, but again, for the new viewers, how many kids, what's going on in your family? Everyone's fine. Can you give us a little background? Yeah, alhamdulillah. So uh, basically, I have uh, two children. Um, I have uh, one little boy called Ibrahim. He's four. And uh, my little daughter is Aisha, and she's one. Um, uh, and yeah, it's just me, my my wife, and my mother. I look after my mother. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're in lockdown again here in uh, in, in England. So it started yesterday. So may Allah SWT make it easy for, you know, everybody who's going through this uh, difficult period with COVID. But, you know, um, my brother, we, we we have so much, you know. I was talking to my wife about it today. I said, you know, what is our lockdown? You know, we get food delivered to us. You know, we're in the comfort of our houses. We have our family with us. You know, we have this internet where we can communicate with our families. And we have no hardships compared to our brothers and sisters who are suffering all around the world, you know, in Syria, right. Yemen, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Kashmir, Iraq. The The, the countries are endless. And uh, subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for our brothers and sisters who are going through uh, mm -hmm. real hardships in the world. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I heard that England went back into lockdown. You mentioned that you have a daughter named Aisha. Yes, I do, yeah. And is there a particular reason you named Aisha? Um, you know, um, uh, of, of course, you know, the, the mother of the believers, uh, you know, Aisha, and her. And, uh, you know, it's just it's a beautiful name. And, you know, um, I, I said to my wife that whenever I name when we when we have children before you know we had children i said i want to name my children something that can have a strong lineage to it like ibrahim you know subhanallah mm. uh you know khalilullah you know subhanallah the friend of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obviously the one who started the lineage where our prophet muhammad sallallahu family came from mm -hmm. and then Aisha, yala, an, you know the the first scholar of our islam you know the mother of the believers subhanallah so yeah. inshallah yeah. they can follow in those footsteps you know i guess my yeah. name is umar as well and i'm, I'm my mom says i'm hard um, I'm a hard-tempered guy. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you tell your mom you have a very soft voice and you also have a soft heart. To come up with these lyrics, you have to have a soft heart also. You know, my, my brother, my, young, my younger brother, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, um, he just had a baby daughter two, three days ago. Three days ago. Okay, mashallah. And he, he, named, he named the daughter Aisha. No, mashallah, barakallah. You know, so we're, so we're so fortunate to have Aisha in our house. And... Uh, we, we we love that name because of our mother Aisha. And yes. um, my brother Abdul Rahim Abdullahi, he knew that um, my brother's wife was expecting, you know, because it's been, she, my brother passed away when my, uh, my his sister in law was in eight months. You know, so they were talking about names and stuff. And um, so one of the names my brother always liked was Aisha. Aisha, you know? And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't here to receive, he was at every single. Every, every hospital, every time a child came in the family, he was in the hospital, outside, praying. And this time he wasn't physically ill. But we definitely love the name. Abdul Rahim loved that name. And the know Abdul Aziz, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, blessed with, and his wife are blessed with a beautiful daughter, named the child Aisha. And I'm looking forward to being with our new Aisha. And hopefully, like you said, these beautiful names. Hope our children and us can live up to these names, inshallah. Exactly, exactly. Alhamdulillah. So, thank you so much, Brother Omar Isa. We really appreciate you. We we enjoy your 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 poem, your nasheed, and continue to do the great work that you're doing. And again, I pray that Allah gives your father the highest Thank you so I mean, much. I mean, thank, thank you, brother. And saying, may Allah subhanahu wa taala give your brother the highest jannah. I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa taala reunite us all with our loved ones. You know, uh, when, when we are on that day of reckoning. I mean, I mean, I mean, inshallah. I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you so much. We were so blessed to have brother Umar, and now we're gonna invite our, our main guest, our main speaker tonight, inshallah. Ahlan wa sahlan, Sheikh Rami. 
Thank you. For, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. We're so blessed. Thank you for waiting. I, I apologize for the delay. No and, worries uh, at all. It was uh, a brother, blessing to uh, to hear um, uh, Brother Omar Isa live. I've seen some videos long a long time ago, but now I'm definitely going to um, look up more and share with my kids as well. Alhamdulillah. You know, my brother is very close to you and he keeps in contact with you. And I apologize. I didn't get to know you well enough, but I, I heard all the, of all the great work that you're doing in California. And you're also part of IOK and the great team uh, of, mashallah, mashallah, the brothers and sisters working there. It's a, it's a dream team there. So may Allah bless you for all the work that you're doing, Brother Rami. Okay. Thank you, mashallah. And uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to begin by offering my condolences again to you uh, and to your family on the loss of your brother. And also just to say, you know, what you shared at the beginning um took a lot of courage and thank you for, you know, for, for doing that. I know it's, it's always difficult to speak about something that's, that's, um, you know, where the pain is that close. Uh, but hopefully for the viewers all over the world, I know people are tuning in from all over the world. I saw some, but some people, uh, tuning in from, uh, the Philippines. So Salamat, uh, to the people in the Philippines. Um, but I think Salamat over there means goodbye. Uh, so not goodbye, but you know, um, but in any case, you know, people are uh, hurting all over the world. Brother Omar mentioned, you know, people are hurting all over the world. Um, and, and for them to, to, to see, you know, how you to, sh to share what you what you how you're going through, how you're coping and also how you're what you're learning through. Uh, hopefully it brings also some um, some ease to the hearts of people around the world. I mean, I mean, you know, I noticed uh, right now too that um, that there was an event that Miftah uh, did uh, a couple of weeks ago for about your brother. So I'm definitely going to to check that out to learn more about him. I never got the honor to meet him while he was alive, but um, hopefully I can learn about him once he's passed away. Uh, one of the things that our Shiuch have said that is that is that, is that the um, uh, sometimes the the impact of the awliya of the friends of Allah. Uh, the impact of them is actually more after they they they've passed away. So we can we hope to see more people impacted uh, and benefited by his uh, by the sadaqat that he's he's put in by the people that he's taught and by by his story and what what he's done. I mean, I mean, jazakumullah. Oh yeah. Are you based on right now? So, hello. sorry, there, um, I can't hear. Um, how about now? How about now? Um, yeah, it's it's okay, okay now. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, I was asking, you are based out of California. Can you tell us some of the work that's going on in California? What are you doing, and where are you based in California at the moment? Right now, I am in uh, in Union City, California, and um, that's where we have our office. But our work in the prison spans over 42 states, uh, over 500 prisons. We've reached over 8,000 Muslim prisoners and also non-Muslim prisoners as well in some of our other life skills programs and re-entry programs um, over 42 states. And alhamdulillah, to date, it's been about 20,000 courses courses that we've delivered. So we teach by correspondence uh, and so forth. So um, although we're located here in California, our reach is, is nationwide. Alhamdulillah. I'm going to take more questions for you and, and inshallah we'll go back and forth. I want to give you five, ten minutes on your okay. own to give our audience some advice. And also for me, I can learn from you. And we're so blessed to have you here. So Bismillah, I'm going to step away and we inshallah we'll, we'll benefit from your reminder. Okay. Inshallah. Uh, Bismillah Muhammad. So I was talk, asked to to speak about second chances, and I have to say that it's it's a very relevant topic, especially to the work that I do to bring um, education and programs to men and women who are incarcerated here in the U.S. That that interacting with them has been the greatest teacher for me to realize the impact of second chances. Um, earlier, we're, we heard. Um, Sheikh Abdullah is sharing about what he learned through the passing of his brother and that that was the greatest teacher. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that learning doesn't always happen in a classroom. And sometimes the greatest lessons that we learn are actually our lived experiences. And this is something that Imam al-Ghazali highlights in his book, Jawahir al-Quran, in 
teaching people how to get closer to the Quran, that it's not just about learning grammar and even um, uh, tajweed, all those, those are needed and necessary to build up our experience with the Quran, but also to go out in the world and experience the world. And we all pray Jum'ah today. Um, and the, the ayah ordering us for Jum'ah afterwards is, uh, 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 then once the prayer is over, then go out in the land. Um, and so going out in life and experiencing life, that can be the greatest uh, experience. So I can go through the numbers and, and talk about how we teach and what we teach. Um, but really what I what what keeps me going, like, why is it that I teach? If somebody were to say, you know, the what's in the hows, I can go through that. We deliver this many courses. This is how we do it. I tell people that if uh, if you're familiar, you know, for those of you in the U.S., if you're familiar with FedEx or what's now called, um, I think it's, it used to be called Kinko's. Now it's FedEx Kinko's. Uh, but if FedEx and a madrasa had a baby, it would be Ta a Taiba Foundation, Taiba Foundation, because we're printing, we're binding, we're shipping, we're tracking, uh, we're answering um, uh, questions, you know, not in a non-traditional learning uh, setting where it's by written correspondence, emails, phone calls, and so forth. Um, so I can go through that, the what's in the, uh, the, 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 the hows, but really for me, what keeps me going is the why. If somebody were to say, you know, why is it? Uh, that, that 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 you keep going and 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 I think one of the, the things is that I really see the power of human change. I've seen it by by dealing with with people who used to be um, drug dealers, murderers, rapists, thieves, whatever you know, every crime you can imagine. But then to see this other aspect of a of a human being, and for me, um, in my experience, and all, just in this, I'm just speaking from my personal life experience. After reading the Sirah and and learning more about the Sahaba and how they interacted and who they were, I've really only been with two communities where I really felt I'm sitting amongst people who are like the Sahaba. Uh, when I sat with people in Mauritania, not just the Shiuch, but just the Mauritanians, um, and 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 what their how they live and their outlook on life and who they are. And then when I'm sitting with in, uh, men incarcerated in prisons um, here in California. Um, and why is that? Because of a couple of reasons. One is because everything is, is stripped from them. Their freedoms, their so many dignities, so many um, basic things that we have, what we take for gra granted. And that through it all, they've become Muslim. So unlike in in Europe, so for example in the U in in the UK and in 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 France, also in um, um, in 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 Australia, you have a large p percentage of people who are Muslim in prison. In in France, it's eighty percent of the people in prison are Muslim. Look up the look up the stacks. Uh, the UK as well. So it's it's. Um, uh, uh, you know, really mind-boggling numbers just to realize, like, why is that? That's a system that's not happening by chance. There's a system behind that that's geared towards getting certain people. So here in the United States, the mass incarceration, mass incarceration overwhelmingly, disproportionately incarcerates black men. Um, and so you, we have to ask ourselves, what's going on in the UK and in France? Large population of Muslims. Australia, same thing. But one of the differences between prisons in the US, uh, sorry, the UK and um, and Australia and the prisons in the US is that the Muslim populations there, they're usually there people were born into uh, born Muslims and then just went astray and ended up in prison. But here in the US, 90% of the Muslims uh, in prison are converts to Islam. And we know this through extensive uh, demographic work that we've done in our applications process. So we can say affirmatively 90% of our students, and we've served over 8,000, are converts to Islam. So they're converting to Islam. People who used to be literally pimps, drug dealers, prostitutes, becoming becoming Muslim. And then to see them, because we, we do a lot of, um, the majority of our education is by correspondence. So we see them write out their lives. We see them write what, what, what they've gone. Just today, I was uh, reviewing um, uh, uh, what, uh, some some work of one of our students. He was 16 years old when he went to prison for life for killing his mother's abusive boyfriend. And there's a whole story behind that. But just think about that. Think about this person what in, and the abuse and the trauma that he went through. And he made a choice. And we're not going to get into you know that choice, but but he changed once he went into prison, and he's a different person. And so for me, I've seen that. I've seen the two 
it's almost like two people. So I interact with people who have been, you, they're, they're Muslim in prison. They're practicing their Islam under the most difficult um, circumstances. I mean, for example, here's a, here's a, 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 a subha, a prayer bead actually given to, to me uh, by one of my students who I taught in prison. He was later, when he came out of prison, he went to my father in his final, uh, my father's final years. We didn't know it was my father's final years, but he was not teaching anybody Arabic anymore. Um, but he, he was a, master poet uh my father was allah yarhamu, um rahimahullah and um and so this brother farooq went said can i study with you and he started teaching him Ar arabic beginning at the very basics um and he was the last student of my father so actually when i when i when i buried my father i was holding it together and i was actually just watching um sheikh abdullah earlier um and really impressed by how how well you're holding it together which which uh, which speaks to uh your the strength of your iman and um, I was holding it together the whole process, the ghusl, lowering my father into the grave. But when Farouk came up to me and I hugged him and I said, you were my father's last student. At that point, I lost it. Um, and and then the tears um, the tears came. But Farouk gave me this these prayer beads. Um, and in prison, they had to they had to fight legal battles for the right to have prayer beads. They had to fight legal battles to write, to wear kufis. They had to fight legal battles to be able to grow beards. We're talking about basic things that maybe we don't think about. So they're practicing, I mean, for, for Ramadan um, was just a few months ago. It's a struggle for them to, to because the, the prison operates on a very regimented schedule. It's military and authoritarian in every sense of the word. And so they have to eat at a certain time. They have to shower at a certain time. So what happens if a person needs to uh, uh, change their meal schedule for Ramadan? Well, for some people, tough luck. Um, and I've heard many stories of people just say, you know, I, I fast all day, not having suhoor, and I'm only, and sometimes they're not allowed to have food in their cells. So they have to, you know, they're offered a tray at a certain time. And if it comes after uh, suhoor, that's it. You you either eat it or you give it back. So they can't store food sometimes in their prison cells. So they're practicing Islam under these dire conditions. They've come to Islam. Again, 90% of them were converts. Practicing Islam, really holding on to it. And, and from that, I really learned to see how, how beautifully people can hold on to the tenets and some of the basic uh, aspects of our, of our deen. And so I see these people, but the and I see them in one light, but there's people out there in the world who see them in a different light. So I might see a brother, you know, who, who's been Muslim 20 years, converted in prison, completely changed his life around, not only transformed his own life, but is working day in, day out to transform other people in the lives, uh, prisoners, and 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 bringing peace to the prisoners, uh, breaking up breaking up fights, um, pre preventing people from getting harmed here in California. Um, two things were really dominate in the in the prisons. One of them is gangs, um, and and the whites have their gangs, the white supremacist gangs, and the white supremacists in California have actually revived a, a white religion because they said, you know what, we don't want Christianity. It's a Semitic religion of Semitic people. We need as white a religion as we can get. So they turned to Odinism. Thor and the hammer of Thor and so forth. And they actually, through their own readings, revived this religion here in the prisons in, in, in California. So you have Odinists, Aryan, white supremacists, and, um, and they will kill people who cross racial lines. They will kill Jewish prisoners. So look at this. One time, a, a student of mine, African-American, former gang member, in for murder, spent uh, over 20 years of his life in prison. He's a convert to Islam, up walks a Palestinian man, with a Jewish prisoner, a Palestinian Muslim, a Jewish white Jewish Muslim prisoner, and the the Jewish prisoner is offering to pay uh, uh, money for the Muslims' protection. He said, "You know, I want jizya. I'll pay jizya for protection against the white supremacists." And the Muslims, they said, "No, no, you don't need to pay uh, us anything. You don't need to do anything. Just exercise with us." on the yard and the supremacists will think that you're Muslim and they won't touch you because now that if they pick a fight with you, they know they pick a fight with the Muslims who are majority black. And then once the, the other, once they get attacked, it just starts a race war. So they don't want to do it. And he did. He, they protected that Jewish uh, uh, prisoner. So I hear so many of these stories, but that prisoner who, who, who did that the family of the murdered people, they know a different person. Just a month ago, I was uh, uh, sitting in on a phone call um, um, 
for uh, a, um, a Muslim brother. Again, he converted to Islam in prison, African-American. He actually claims to be innocent. He has proof that he's innocent. Um, and I know there's a lot of cases of that, of people who are innocent in, in, in the prison and they're um, um, uh, wrongly incarcerated. But he was there for 30 years. He's up for parole. And the state promises 25 years to life. So at 25, if you've transformed your life, you can have parole. And I'm sitting there on the call advocating for his, because um, now the, the 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 hearings are now on Zoom and on, on phone calls, advocating for, for his release. Well, after I, I spoke and the, the lawyer uh, who we um, also brought in to help it to, to help his case when she spoke and then we're listening to the next the next case. Um, and it's a person who's been in prison for 30 years for murder, a gruesome murder. But he's completely changed his life. This is not a Muslim prisoner, but he's changed his life and the state actually released him. But I listened to five of the victim's family members and they said, you know, for them, the pain is still real. So here we have one individual who 30 years ago create, committed a crime and that family still knows him as that person and they don't want to forgive and they have the haq, they have the right not to forgive. We have to remember that, that when we transgress against another person, that person can hold it to us until Yom Al-Qiyamah and it should be a, a reminder to us and fearful. You know, when we transgress against Allah, the rights of Allah, He can forgive us in the dunya, in the akhirah. But if a person, if we transgress against the rights of a person, that person has the right, they have the haq um, to hold it until Yom Al-Qiyamah and the, this family did. Um, and so I thought of, you know, of the many people who we serve and we know them, we know one aspect of their life, this changed person. But other people, they don't, you know, they, they remember the, the, the person before um, uh, the crime. As a story from the seerah, we know that the Prophet ﷺ, one of the, his most beloved people was his uncle Hamza, Asadullah, the line of Allah. And it was Wahshi, who now we say, radiallahu anhu, who, who speared him, who assassinated him. But it was difficult, even after Wahshi became Muslim, it was difficult for the Prophet ﷺ, to 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 because it, it 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 reminded him of the pain that he lost. He accepted, of course, his Islam and he accepted his Tawbah. And Islam yujibu ma qabla. Islam will wipe out and remove all the sins of what's before. But there's still something, you know, at the end of the day, we're human beings. So so we have to in our societies, we have to recognize that people, even when we want to give second chances to some people. And may Allah protect you from ever being the victim or having a family member who's a victim of crime. We want no more victims in our society. But if I was ever a victim or my family was ever a victim, I don't know if I could, and that person went through a transformation, I don't know if I would be able to see that new person. I hope, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me the tawfiq to be able to do that. But it's very difficult for victims and families of the victims to see the new person. And then other people who, who never who never knew the person as, as that original person, they can see this new person. But we need both people in society. We need both people. of We need people who remember the wrongs that people did so that they can work to seek justice and they can maintain justice. Allah says that one of the ways to maintain balance is the dunya is people pushing back. We just went through this extensive election process here in the U.S. And mashallah to everybody there in, in, in Michigan. You guys came out in, in, in huge numbers. Um, but out here in California, ballots come up or everywhere. Ballots, propositions, elections. And people have these discussions, have these debates. It's not an authoritarian system. So we need people. We need the victims advocates. We need people to remind us, no, you know the new person. But I know the old person and we need people who can see the new person and say, we understand that and we understand your pain and you have rights as a victim. But we also have to give people second chances. And we also if they if they've paid their debts to society, if if this if the society has said you after 10 years, after 10, 20 years, after 15 years, after reforming yourself, after proving you can have your, your freedom again, that people give them the second chance and that they, and that they're there for them. Um, so. That's what I would like to share, and I know we can open it up to questions now. Uh, but in 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 my years of of working with these men and women, um, I've really seen the power of Toba, lived Toba, of people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes. At the same time, there's a lot of people in there for uh, bogus and made up crimes. I mean, you can have somebody, uh, literally, and I know this is a case 
who was a 17-year-old for the possession of crack cocaine, possession, not selling, not distributing, not manufacturing for the possession, was given three life sentences. And he served over 20 years of those until he was able to get out um, uh, with the help of lawyers. Otherwise, he would still be there uh, today. And yet we see the white swimmer over here in Stanford, if you're not uh, familiar with that case, uh, just look up, type in the, the, the Stanford swimmer. Um, and he's actually known as the Stanford rapist, but he only served three months in jail. When I see that, the lady justice is not blind. She has her blindfold off and she's looking and she's discerning. And she says, oh, this is a white wealthy person. We're going to give him or her a certain sentence. And this is a poor white man or woman or a person of color. We're going to give them a different sentence. And so lady justice in the U.S. is not blind. And I've seen that firsthand. But those people who have committed crimes and they've gone through these transformations just to see that power of Toba and to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us second chances um, through through Toba. Um, and the final thing I'll say is, is, is another thought is that Allah gives gives us second chances and he tells us to look, you know, to, to turn to him and to make istighfar. And Brother Umar Isa ended with a nasheed on istighfar. Um, and so we're always turning to Allah and we're always asking for forgiveness. And we know our sins. We know our sins better than anybody else. We're the, we're the ones who knows our uh, who, who know our sins. And we ask istighfar and we want Allah to forgive us and give us a second chance. But why is it that when somebody wrongs us and now we hold the power of forgiveness or not, that we'll say, you know what? I'll see you on Yom al -Qiyam. And I'm not saying people who have grieve, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm talking about the little things. The big things, if a person wants to hold that till Yom al -Qiyam, they have that right. Although there's there's a lot of research and science. There's actually a forgiveness center here in, in California, in, the, in, in Stanford, uh, that's that's looked at, at, at the power of forgiveness for the victim. When you forgive, it's you're you're benefiting yourself. And and when I when I when I read that, it was just the scientific um uh support for a hadith that we know that the Prophet sallallahu said he asked his sahaba can any of you be like Abu Dumdum and they said who is Abu Dumdum they said he was the person when he would leave his house he would say Allahumma inni tasaddaqtu bi irdi ala nas oh Allah I give in sadaqa um my my rights my ird my dignity uh, in other words if somebody has wronged me I forgive them so we can take some lessons from that, and it looks like we're going to come back to the Q&A and the panel discussion. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Lami. Wallah, that was very nice. That was very inspiring. I'm very insightful, and the work that you do, very few, you know, people can do what you're doing, and people have the ability and the tawfiq to do what you're doing. Um, Sheikh, uh, so you are working with, and, and your topic on Second Chance was Excellent topic, Sheikh Abdul Wahab. Or someone. You, you guys chose it, so. Excellent topic and excellent way of discussing it. It's amazing how many people the Prophet ﷺ had to give second chances to. Like, I think everyone around him was like a second chance. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I'll give you a second chance, I'll give you a second chance. Like, you know, afallahu anq. Like the whole, Allah, literally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to tell the Prophet ﷺ, there's some people you just can't give them a second chance or a third chance or a fourth yeah. chance. He gave them so many chances Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet Surah Tawbah, Afallahu anq, lima adinta lahum, hatta yitabayyad in the Sadaqwa Ta'ala and God. Like, you did it so much, and, until they literally, they did so much wrong that God had to like, expose their evil plots. So these were the hypocrites, eventually. Um, so I, I see that, that how you said about Hamza, and Wahshi radiallahu anhuma, that the Prophet Surah Tawbah accommodated them. And amazing, like, how today, uh, a spouse is not ready to give their spouse a second chance. Yeah. A friend is not ready to give a friend a second chance. So that's one thing I want to talk about a little bit. And the second thing I think is most important, which is like the heart of the topic, is you have a system that you're working on and uh, people who are incarcerated, especially the marginalized Muslim community in prison. And then you have the prisoners who are coming out in a support mm -hmm. system. For that. You're talking about 90% of these people who convert to Islam, either in prison or after, after prison. And 50% of you know African-Americans leave Islam later too, you know, like too, because of the challenges they have and lack of support system they have. And I think the, the biggest question that rests upon our shoulders is that how many times that people come out of, you know, they've lost their family. They're not going to get a job because of their, 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 their criminal record, correct? And, and it just, they're coming back into society. Just imagine someone that's moved to like a third world country or the Middle East, now comes back to America after 20 years. How hard is it for that person to get a job? Mm -hmm. Like 
everything has changed. His connections have, have moved out. And, and now this person is coming back out of jail 20 years later, many years later. And the Muslim community that's always said, we are brothers, we're sisters, we're one family. You know, like we... we, we, we can tell you a couple stories about that? You can tell us. I know two brothers. One brother spent 29, about 28 years in prison and he was freed uh, through the Innocence Project. If you're not familiar with the Innocence wow. Project uh, and for any of the v viewers, they do excellent work. Pro bono lawyers take up cases where people are clearly innocent and they work on their cases. Not always successful, uh, su successful, but sometimes they are. So this brother, Asim, um, uh, Asim, he came out after 28 years and there's a picture on our website of him walking out of San Quentin State Prison as a free man after 28 years. Well, he became Muslim in prison and he really loved Islam. The first thing he wanted to do, where was the first place you think he wanted to go? Masjid. He went to the masjid, exactly. He wanted to go, he wanted to make sajda in the masjid because he's been making sajda in a prison cell, sajda in a prison yard, sajda in a prison chapel. It might have crosses and they have to cover it up with sheets and so forth. So he says, I just want to go to a masjid. He goes to that masjid. He sees a brother, a Muslim brother, and uh, and he won't mention his ethnicity. I mean, I won't mention the ethnicity, but if we were to have a long drawn out discussion, I think it would be worth mentioning. Um, because it's multiple ethnicities. And he says, Assalamu yeah. alaikum. And you know what the brother's response is? Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum. Which is the response we give to who? A non Muslim. I know another brother who spent 13 years in prison for robbery, armed robbery. He became Muslim in prison, changed his whole life around. He's actually one of the people who introduced me to this work. And he's one of the, uh, uh, I have to credit him with the work that I'm doing now with Flava Foundation. He introduced me to the first students. And that story is as well as in a short documentary on our website. Same thing. He went to pray Dhuhr at a masjid. He goes over there. He sees this brother, older sheikh. I won't mention his ethnicity, but long beard, turban. Uh, and he's thinking, oh, this is the ideal Muslim. But the, in both situations, the, the, the converts are African-American. Uh, so he walks into this masjid, same exact scenario, both here in the Bay Area. It says, assalamu alaikum. The person looks at him and says, wa alaikum. Now, this brother took it up with the imam. He told the imam after he says, and, and this is another thing about the brothers in the prison and the sisters. For them, like I said, a kufi, a beard, a, a suha, they had to fight for. So these, any symbols of Islam, any of the sha'a'at of Islam, they really hold on to them. So yeah. you know, if, if somebody it just doesn't give me my salam, I'll be like, okay, you know, what, you know, what a punk. Uh, but this brother is like, no, that's my haq. You know, I gave him a salam. You need to return, return my salam. So he complained to the imam. Beautifully, beautiful, right? He tells the imam, he says, imam, brother imam, this person did not give me my salam, did not return it properly. He went for his right. And he it says haq. He turns to him and he says, he gave you his uh, salams. You need to return a full salam. But imagine if that's the people are hesitant about giving salams. What about bringing them into the community? And one of the main things that we hear from our students as they go in is not being accepted in the masjid. And we actually have to coach them. We like we have to remind them you're going to the masjid. The masjids belong to Allah, not to the boards, not to the communities. They're just caretakers. You're going to make sajda in the masjid to your Lord and just. Duck and weave amongst all that other jahiliyyah. But we, that's where we have to work, you know. Unbelievable. And then every time you hear, I'm sure there's not one or two stories, but every time you hear a story like this, I mean, it doesn't get frustrating. And it just, you know, because I'm yeah. from Flint. I'm from Flint. And Flint has in their, in their city um, uh, jails so many Muslims. And they come home, they come out, you know, they, they do some hard labor work, they, you know. And of course, man, they got to start a life all over again. You know, they don't know whether uh, their kid, the kid's mom is gone, you know, probably with someone else. And their kids, we don't, no one really follows up with them. They come back, we're that Muslim community. SubhanAllah, you know, I mean, a prisoner can stay in the Prophet's mosque, Thumama bin Uthat, Thumama. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stay in the Prophet's yeah. mosque three days, three days. And after seeing, uh, he's a non Muslim and he's a spy, he's doing treason on the Muslims. He's captured by the Muslims inside the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu And after three, every time the Prophet Sallallahu would come up to him, he's like, ma indaka ya thumama. What do you have to answer? He would say, in taqtul taqtul da damin wa in tun imtun ma'ala shakir wa in tun idil ma fasal ma ta'ta. He says, you want to take my blood? You have the right. I've done treason. You want to forgive me? I promise you won't find anyone more grateful. If you want money for my ransom, my, my tribe will give you everything you want. The Prophet ignored him. Came back the second day, same thing. Third day. 
Same question, exact same reply. I'm trying to summarize this. And then after that, the Prophet says, release him, let him go. He leaves the masjid, goes to a garden, takes a shower, changes his clothes, comes back. And he's, like you said, you know, people, he's a bold person too. There was no face that I detest. I hated more than your face. Speaking to the Prophet in yeah. front of me. On this earth, I didn't like anyone. I hated you the most. Now, there is no face on the surface of the earth that I love more than your face. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'll give, you a modern, I'll give you a modern day example. There was one brother. Uh, uh, now he's a now he's a Muslim brother, uh, white white Muslim. Um, uh, and before he was Muslim, when before he was in prison, he used to go to this liquor store, and the liquor stores were Muslim. You know, we also have that in our community, and that's something we have to root out. You know, the the Muslim liquor store owners. Um, but they were even in their akhlaq to him. You know, they were very rude to him. So he hated them so much. He didn't know anything about Islam. He just knew that these people who, who mistreated him were Muslim. So he goes to his tattoo parlor. And he's like, man, I want to get a tattoo that would really make those Muslims mad. The wow. tattoo artist says, you know what? I got the perfect thing for you. I'm going to tattoo kafir in Arabic right here in the shape of a gun. Oh, my and God. Like common for tattoo. You can type it up. Tattoo, kafir, gun, uh, rifle, AK-47, or it might be an AR. I can't remember exactly what it is. But anyway, he gets kafir tattooed on his neck. Long story short, he, he commits a crime, goes to prison becomes Muslim in prison, starts studying the deen in prison. Now he's the imam uh, leading prayers for the Muslims in his prison with the tattoo that says kafir on his neck. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's a we have white supremacists becoming Muslim, and we have their stories with former gang members. I mean, imagine uh, former gang members who used to be at there, you know, would have killed each other on sight. Those two become Muslim, and a white supremacist who would have tried to kill both of them. Now all three of them become Muslim, you know, and it's salam alaikum, brother. Oh my goodness. Sometimes it looks like they commit they committed the crime so they can go to jail so God can guide them and eventually go to paradise. You what know? You said right there is the words that have come out. Uh, one brother he came, he went to prison for 28 years for a crime he didn't commit. And I said, Really? You're not resentful for 20? He said, You know what? If that's the way Allah wanted to guide me, alhamdulillah. Oh my God. Rida and contentment. Subhanallah. 28 years. Subhanallah. But he says, if that's the way Allah wanted to guide me, alhamdulillah. If it took 28 years of being isolated away from family, but in the end of the day, I'm going to paradise, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. So we're seeing this. And now in our communities, um, Sheikh, you know, what should we do? You know, I somebody asked me this question, and my I have I have a friend, a student of mine, who goes to a lot of my students, they give khutbahs at local jails and they talk to me about it, and they are they do some part-time chaplaincy at the jails, and they ask me what to read to them and what ta'aleem should be done, and and they have their questions and, and fights within the jail. And mm -hmm. these are youngsters in college, you know, they're trying to they're trying to help out, and they come to me and ask me my simple advice, and I and I give them my advice. And I have a lot of friends who came out of jail. A lot of my African-American friends, myself, I know. The best people in the world, man. I'm telling you, they're just so humble. They'll give their life for you. Mm -hmm. And they know brotherhood like no one else does. Yeah. Yep. And uh, some of them have done the nikah for them. It's, you know, one brother said to me, Sheikh, um, I, I, got, I, got, I, got the, I got the sister I want to marry, Sheikh. I said, like, how do you know? He's like, he said, my mom hugged her. My mom hugged her. And I said, what do you mean your mom hugged her? How is that like a real, like, how is that like your mom's isn't that your mom hugged her? He's like, in my culture, the African-American culture, he's like, if your mom hugged the girl, that means she's happy. My mom hugged nobody. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow, that's pretty strange. My mom hugged a lot of ladies before, you know, but, but the reality is, um, the thing is, they're such beautiful people. Yeah. They look so beautiful. They act so beautiful. They have such a beautiful demeanor, you know? And, it, and it's just that, I wish we had people like you and the people of the Sifat of the Prophet Sallallahu and Sahaba, how they were able to embrace people. And yeah. I, I said to them, I, this was my, and you can correct me, and you can add on to this because I know you have a better answer. Um, I said to them, the only way we can find a solution to converts and also people who come out of con incarceration is the Ukhuwa system that was between the, mm -hmm. the Muhajireen and the, and the Ansar. You have to, you can't, you can't leverage them to just figure it out themselves. Yeah. You might end up back in jail, which is really a mm -hmm. high chance. You have to. They might take your money from you. 
You, they might borrow your car from you. <laughs> they might, you know, and they might want to sleep in your basement and come two eight o'clock in the morning. A lot, a lot of challenges. Who cares? It, I mean, of course, we have to be systematic, but the reality is that we have to have a, a, a approach to this. Yeah. You know, our Muslim communities have so much filthy money. Like we have money for this. We just need to have the intention to help them. Like yeah. it's not Muslim communities. Mashallah, mashallah. You know, one brother, one sister can sponsor a million dollars and a good fund. Some of them must have it, you know, and and it's just like I feel like we need to somehow, like you said. So I said that the Uhuwa system, brother, the brother comes in from outside convert or someone that came out of jail right away. He's in parole. You got You got. You got to help. Someone needs to get to that right away. On it, help them educate. Yeah. You got to teach them Quran, Salah, maybe, maybe they already know, but some come out, you know, every process. And it's just like, I hope we can do it. So what do you have as a better answer in dealing with people? Because not all of us can go into the in prison and help them out like chaplains like you are. I'm sure people do. But what is the system for brothers and sisters that we can help those who are coming out? How can we find them and how can we refine them? Find them and help them. Excellent question. And I think, you know, uh, there was a there was something you were saying um, it was on the tip of your tongue. You didn't say it, but you said, you know, we have to figure out a s approach. But yeah, I think you were about to say system. Okay. That's really what we need. We need a systematic approach mm -hmm. um, because the reality is, and I've seen this again firsthand, there are people who will come out of uh, prison. They became Muslim in prison, converted. Allah forgave them. We understand that. If we, if we welcome them with too much of an open arm and maybe a naive uh, approach, we could very well get taken advantage. And I've seen, I have countless stories uh, of that, of, of people going into Muslim communities, taking advantage. And then, you know, because some of these people have not changed. Um, some of them ha are, are, have still maintained their ways of con being con artists and manipulation. And sometimes they don't even realize, you know, if you have so had somebody since the time he was 12 years old, he or she, and they're involved in crime and they're just life of the streets, it takes a lot to really change that, change that life. So the shahada, alhamdulillah, removes the sin spiritually, gives them the key for, uh, for moving forward. But now it's like there's a lot of coaching to relearn new, new things. So what I would say as a, as a systematic solution is that we need to have training. Training for the people who actually are going to go into and work in the capacity of chaplains, uh, because you also have to realize the reality of the situations that they are in. Um, uh, and 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 sometimes answers for people on the street might be different than what you give it's not we're not saying we dilute islam or we change islam but it's understanding you know uh the ifta you know giving you the fatwa ibn abbas radiallahu anhuma one time was asked hal lil qatili min tawba can a murderer be forgiven can a can a person who killed somebody be forgiven he says no and then later on somebody came up asked the same exact question hal lil qatili min tawba he said naam yes and the people, his people in around him were like, what? You told this person a uh, murderer can be forgiven and this person, no, what happened? He said, well, in, in the case of one person, I could see the anger of revenge in his, you know, the 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 the, the of revenge in his face. He just wanted to get his loophole before he did the crime. Wow. And in the other person, I could see Nadama on his face. I could see remorse on his face. And, and so he had committed a crime. So I told him, yes, you can. So this Amazing. is the job of a, a, of a mufti, of a teacher. You have to look at the, the context of a person and make sure that you're giving them uh, what they need. I can give many, many examples, but for people who are going into prison, in addition to proper study of Islam, uh, uh, to, to understand their context. And then for our massages to really have to be trained in how to, you know, to, to make it systematic. If somebody comes and asks for zakat, you know, a lot of masajid used to just give cash and go take on face value, but we don't do that anymore in a lot of masajid. Most masajid have zakat applications. You know, they ask for things. It's a process. Um, you know, domestic violence is a reality in, in all human communities, Muslim communities in, in, in as well. When a sister approaches an imam, unfortunately, a lot of times the masjid or the imam doesn't know how to deal with it. Now there's systems being developed and masjid can get trained. How do you do, how do, you do that? Muhsin. Uh, to train masajid how to be welcoming to uh, people with special needs in our masajid. I know one sister, she works in the public school system, and she says she sees the Muslim families and she knows they have special needs children, but they're not bringing them to the masjid and they'll bring their children who are not special needs to the, to the masjid. Why? Stigma and shame and not being accommodated and so forth. So, so, yes, we need a systematic approach in our masajid for 
uh, treatment and of 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 the poor, the mesakin, and how we do have the zakat distribution. Um, also, the, the 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 women, the vulnerable people in our community, domestic violence, special needs, everybody, and everybody and others as well. We feed the poor and the and the orphan and the prisoner. We feed you for the sake of Allah. We don't need any thanks or any uh, com com uh, compensation. But there needs to be a system. So if somebody walks through uh, a masjid, a uh, person in the masjid, even if it's that a khuwa system, you know, okay, is that person trained? Uh, if a person's still struggling with addiction, if they're still struggling with some of their crimes, are we are we able to 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 do, to, do, uh, to 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 treat that? How many masajid in the United States have um, addictions group therapy in the masjid. Probably one or two. I know one here in in um, in in California. They have an addiction support group in the masjid for alcohol and drug use in the masjid. But the wow. imam is a former prisoner, former death row inmate from San Quentin, California. But he knows the reality. But wow. you go to churches, you go to uh, uh, synagogues all over the place. There are addiction support groups all over the place. Why don't we have that in masjid? We don't have addiction in our community. We do. I run a friends and family addiction support group with some of the, the material that we've develop, developed through Taiba, And I know these. The, it's a reality. And so this is, uh, and I'll uh, uh, end with this, but... When we look at people coming back from prison, we have to have this system. Some are completely changed. They're not going to take advantage. Some are changed to a certain extent, but they need support. And then there's some who are actually more of a benefit to us as our as our community than they're going to be taking. So if our masajid, if we need addiction support group, wouldn't it be good to have a former addict who actually ran support groups in the prisons and got people off of their addictions? And now they come in and say, hey, you, do you need a professional? I did a lot of research to see if any Muslim countries have developed Islamically integrated addictions treatment programs. And we have big countries like Malaysia and Indonesia and Iran and other places. Afghanistan has a big heroin epidemic. Um, you know, there's meth, uh, uh, meth epidemic in, um, in, in Pakistan. I met a, a doctor from Pakistan who told me he said meth is all over the place there. Um, but they don't have an Islamically integrated thing. We some of our students in, in, in Taiba in the prison have done that. And so we hope one day that these students can take this material, which is soon to be published, and go to those Muslim countries, say, you if you need experts, we have the experts. They were developed right here in the United States prison system. Unbelievable. I mean, I, you know, one of my one of my dreams would be like to have a proper rehab for for Muslims, like for addictions, like a spiritual rehab. I was at a I was at an addiction rehab uh, conference once and it was a non-Muslim. And these rehab centers, whether they're privatized or they're funded by the government or insurance, man, they're huge. Yeah. Really, oh, a big business. Big business, right? You have people who have gone to uh, alcohol addiction and other um, addictions, drug addictions. I mean, for Muslims, if now if somebody has to go through rehab for their addictions, they have to go to a, a, a place that's going mm -hmm. to be, you know, like, I mean, contrary to the Islamic values. At the least, you know, and they might get their rehab, of course, but you need to couple it with both. You need the mental, the emotional and the spiritual yep. and the physical. You need all of this at one time and you need someone that can take them off of the kufr, the batil, the vice, the, the addictions of desires and bring them back on the truth. And religion has to be used. So if we're not if we're not leading this, then a Christian organization or another faith based organization will be. Educating them on their on their um, on their permits and on their choice. So I think you're right. Like masjids can get educated, like Sheikh just mentioned, educated, educate ourselves. What are these programs that they has on their website and learn more about this? Study and actively be nice to those people who are suffering and who need help and who are who have come out of out of prison system. Respect them. I I respect them for what they've gone through, you know, and be there for them. And honestly. People don't know this. Like you said right there, the guy got greeted two stories where he said he said assalamu alaikum to a phys, you know appearance religious type of person. That, that word religious is just so yep. you know it's it's used at a very broad spectrum. But this appearance was like you know somewhat of a Muslim, and he says assalamu alaikum gets a very cold answer. Brothers and sisters, people can tell the way you greet them. Mm -hmm. People are not stupid, and because you're practicing Muslim and you're not a prey and you see someone of color. People are so smart, especially the guys who are coming out of jail. And, and just, 
to build on that point right there, one of the things that they have to do as a survival technique, and for the, anybody who's, who's, who's interested in, in, in learning about um, uh, trauma response and how the brain responds to trauma, um, and, and one of the things that happens with children who are abused, and may Allah protect all of our children and all of the children of Beni Adam, uh, of our father Adam, from ever having to deal with abuse, but it's a reality amongst humanity that children get abused. Well, one of the things that, that happens is that they, 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 get, uh, they develop a heightened sense to nonverbal cues. And so they can see like a person, they have to, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, survival response. And so in prison, that response to be able to read a person within a, a millisecond, is this person an enemy? Is this person trying to hurt me? Is this person friend or foe? And so that it could kick in the fight, uh, fight, flight, or, or, or fight, flight, or freeze response. And I mentioned that one time to a brother from prison. He said, chef, he said, there ain't no, there ain't no freeze and there ain't no flight. There's just fight. fight. That's it. That's fight. Um, because it's real. There's no place to run when you're locked in a, in a unit. It's like the only response is if you're going to survive is just fight. Um, and so if they develop this and uh, to be able to read human beings, like you said, it not they don't have just the normal human beings ability to read. You know, does this person give me the cold shoulder? Do, are they annoyed at me? It's it's heightened. Um, and and so we when they come in, yeah, if if people give them that response, and sometimes all it takes is one. Um, negative uh, reaction, and they and they're gone. One ugly uh, stare. One ugly stare. One demeaning look. One thing, um, uh, you do have in your community there in Detroit, Dream of Detroit, under the leadership of Mark Crane. Uh, mashallah, wonderful brother, wonderful fa family as well. His wife um, um, uh, is also doing a lot of work with Believers Bailout and other other things. Uh, Sister Gomez. Um, and the, they, they have a house that they've actually purchased and rehabilitated. It's called the Dream of Detroit Project Homecoming. Uh, and we've part, they've partnered with us so that we are going to uh, offer the educational aspect of, of, of the house. So if you're interested in supporting a local project, uh, look up Dream of Detroit. Um, and and they, they just recently did a news article about it. Uh, but that's one thing. If you have a message and you're interested in, in, in knowing how to develop a re-entry program, uh, we have a, a, a PDF on our website uh, that you can download and it gives some some directions. And it was actually developed by three formerly incarcerated Muslims who are on our staff. So our staff, we have a lot of formerly incarcerated Muslims on our staff as teachers. Um, and we want to build up that um, that capacity within with, within the formerly incarcerated community. I mean, mashallah, this is excellent work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you guys. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that our community is, and I can see from the chat, people are so interested, Sheikh. And what you're doing is, it's a fard kifaya, man. It's something that has to be done. And if someone's not doing it, we're all going to be accountable on the Day of Judgment. So all of us should be somewhat engaged, actively involved. And, you know, I wish, I hope one day uh, I can be involved in opening a Muslim rehab. Um, I wish, you know, we have a boarding school. We have, you know, a lot of students that come for boarding. And there's some students who just don't cut the educational uh, boarding standard. And I say this to my brothers all the time. They need to go to a rehab. For the you know issues they have, whether it's uh, mental health issues or whether it's just addiction issues, whatever they have, I said I said to my brother every time we say we we are unable to accept an applicant because of their parents are telling us they have these addictions, so we're sending them to your boarding school and you can fix them. We're like, no, this is not a rehab. This is an education institution where we produce hafiz and scholars and imams. We love to take, and and it's a lot. It's a lot to ask from an institution to do that. And we don't want other parents to tell us like there's one child that's coming in, he's coming giving out drugs, and that's gonna be a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to be somewhat. We have to follow our uh, follow the code of our, our school. And in 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 end of the day, um, my 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 approach to this is that I wish there was a place that I could be you like you're there that these people can go in for six months. There's adults. Mm -hmm. I have friends and uh, you know family friends whose children are addicted all across the world. Where can they go? They yeah. are miserable. Because when there's one addicted child in the house, right, on drugs or even pornography or anything, you know, wasting money, gambling, you know, something. They don't even know what they're doing at that point, you know. They're just trying to find something to stimulate them. They don't know what to do. They're so yeah. embarrassed. There is no avenue. They lose hope. And the life, the entire family gets dilapidated. Yeah. Like, the father, the brother, the sister, that, that one person. And that one person who's doing it, he has no concern of what's happening around. He just wants, as I used to say, the hardest person to give da'wah to is a druggie. Yeah. 
Someone said to me, he said, why? I said, either they're on drugs or they're in search for drugs. Their mind is already occupied. You know, mm -hmm. like, how do you talk to someone who's like that? So yeah. the, the work is great. There's so much work. And I feel like the Muslim community is the solution to these problematic issues. People who are coming out of incarceration. Muslims, if you ignore them, who else is going to stand up for them? Yeah. yeah. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu this, that, now your turn. We're talking to you, Muhammad. You were you were an orphan. You were poor. We gave you all of this. Now it's your turn making sure that you're giving this back to the Ummah. And the Prophet was the most generous yeah. the most kind. And that the concept of just remembering. That you have a favor upon Allah has a favor upon you, you have to favor someone else. So I think there's a lot that we have to do. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it sometimes people think that I want to become a better Muslim by praying or by giving charity or by fasting. Getting involved into Islamic work is the best way to stay on course of Islam. And the beautiful thing about getting involved into the service of Islam is that it gets your family involved. And it gets becomes a mission, it becomes a vision, it becomes a mindset, it becomes a purpose of life. And when you die, there's a there's a family carrying that legacy of service, whether it's a masjid or a Saturday school or institute or this rehab stuff that we're talking about, helping people coming out of incarceration. That's what we need to do. We need to build this form of ownership that we are going to live and die as law-abiding citizens applying the Prophet's teachings in mm -hmm. our country. And, and the beautiful thing about what you said is like, you know, all these Muslim countries, you'd be amazed. Like maybe there is a Muslim country that has some rehab system for uh, incarcerated people or people for um, and other other programs. They do, yeah, but it's not it's not it's not as developed as needs it needs to be. Yeah. And I had to say this, Sheikh, they are still even if they have something developed, a preliminary or advanced, they're going to look back at America. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're look back at America. This is where we have to do it right because this can serve. To the entire world. Yeah, I mean, and one I, of the things that we have here at Leiba is one of the people who helps us, and in, 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 we've consulted with him. Is he's one of the the leading addiction specialists at Stanford, and he's helping us develop our programs in conjunction with the, the the Muslim prisoners who are in prison, who are leading groups and sometimes intensive therapeutic communities where they're living twenty four hours and they're leading dormitories full of just like treat uh, addiction treatment. Um, so we have a lot, a, a, a lot. You know, a lot to offer. Just before my brother passed away, I had spoken to like four or five very powerful people, influential people, wealthy people. I said, I just need like five, ten million dollars. And I, we were thinking about where to build a rehab center. And I said, I said, Michigan, it's good with the weather. I think for rehab, you need sun and you need, uh, you know, then we talk about Florida. I said, then you're going to have a lot of fitna, you know. So we were just thinking of where to place this. And we were like, so I said, and it's we were just discussing, and my mind is like, I, I don't think it's hard for me to get ten million dollars. There's you know wealth is all around. It's just I was just talking to my brothers. I talked to Sheikh Abdul about this. I said one, and I told my brothers we got the schools going, the day school, boarding school, miftah. So one of my dream would be before leaving the world, and you know earlier, inshallah, yeah, you know, if I can do it when I'm young, is to like a massive um, rehab resort. I don't mm -hmm. want to call it a rehab center, rehab resort. You come there if for eight, ten months. If that person comes through, he gets his mental, spiritual rehab, and he learns Arabic and Quran, right? Yeah. They come out coming like little mini sheikhs, you know, yeah. you know and or sheikhas, and they come out of these programs, and we're not there to manipulate them or brainwash them and make them come out in a, in a conservative manner, but the idea is to take them out of their shackles of desires and bring them back onto their ownership yeah. of their personality. And I was just talking about this, and and I said five ten million dollars is a joke. I said, you know, people are spending like twenty million dollars on these resorts right now for this, for like for rehab, and you know. Yeah. But of course, um, I I just want to do this so bad because I hear so much cry and so much pain out there. Oh, yeah, and they don't have families. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, your position in the community, and anybody who's watching here, who's who's in the position that that we hold in the community, you know, as as um, uh, 
teachers, imams, you know, whatever, whatever position, we hear these stories, people coming to us and, you know, mother's like, I don't know what to do. Or a mother and, and her child is, is, is struggling with addiction. She's afraid to even talk to her, her, her husband about it. And the husband kind of knows something's going on, you know? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. It's suffering in silence. They don't know where to turn to. Um, so there needs to be training. There needs to be um, a, a awareness building, there needs to be acceptance. And what I tell people, I said, if you have anybody who's who, who has the possibility of of turning to uh, of turning to uh, substances, going down that road, drugs or alcohol, and they don't feel comfortable enough to turn back to you, then you have to work on your relationship. Wow. And um, what I've one time uh, a, a brother, one of our students from Taiba, he's he became Muslim at fifteen and constantly incarcerated and reincarcerated and has tattoos all over his face. But one time when he was you know, flat out drunk sends me a text, Sheikh, I got a problem. What is it, brother? Let's walk through this, you know, and, and, and uh, it's not to belittle being drunk, but as you know, you, there's certain questions. And one of the first things I ask is, do you have a vehicle or do you have a, access to a weapon? Are you thinking of hurting yourself or somebody else? Um, cause actually what he said to me was I can't go on like this. And so when a person starts saying that you also have to be tune your ear to what might be suicide ideation and so on and so forth. But in any case, um, so I walked him through that and, and another brother, same thing. He went from, uh, having a stable job, stable, uh, uh house about to get married to a Muslim sister here in the community to living in a gutter down here in, 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 in the, the South Bay area. But he know when he gets back up, come on, you can come right. We're going to give you, you know, that second chance, just like the Sahabi who had a drinking problem at the time of the prophet Sallallahu and they lashed him for the drinking problem. He got his punishment, you know, but when the people started calling him by names, the prophet Sallallahu stopped him. He said, you, this, he loves Allah and his messenger. In other words, like this, you're looking at him as the alcoholic. I'm looking at him as the one who loves Allah and his messenger. Uh, who happens to have drank some alcohol, not the alcoholic. Um, so, so terms and titles are very important in, in the way we look at people, but we have to, we, you know, you know, those families suffering, they're suffering right now. Um, and they need a place to turn to training where, where we have Muslim addictions because a, a lot of these places that they can go to are Christian based, or even if they're not Christian based, how accommodating are they for their faith? And so now this person's got to, you know, navigate a system of a rehab. Uh, if it's a, if it's a, residential rehab and then like well how do i wear my hijab how do i get my halal meals how do i make my prayers on time you know do i have to go to bible studies is that a mandate a mandate which some housing transitional housing uh, do so there's definitely a need and to have people who have compassion who can treat it not, not like this is haram you know astaghfirullah you need to stop doing it and like okay let's understand you know it, uh, over the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time, I'm not an addictions counselor or specialist, but I've spent a lot of time studying about addiction and trying to learn more about it. Um, and, um, and, and it really in increases your, your compassion for people who are, who are, who are, who turn to substances. Subhanallah, Sheikh Rami, we um, are so happy that you're a scholar, you've educated yourself and you're a teacher. And I love the way you talk about your your the the people that you're helping incarceration. You call them your students, and and I love that about that because you don't call them out like oh they're ex uh, convent uh, uh, ex criminals or you know or people who are incarcerated. You talk with so much respect about them. Imagine how much respect you have around them. That's unbelievable. That's so pure. That's so genuine. May Allah bless you for Amen. what. And I just want to take one, two questions. So you are right now in the Bay Area. Where are you? You said you're in, in the Bay Area? Union City. Union City. California. Yeah. ILK is Southern California. I know the wonderful brothers who, who are who are leading that under Sheikh Nu'man Beg, uh, Sheikh uh, Furhan, uh, so many other, uh, so many people. But they're about six hours south of us. Okay. And you are, um, as as a person, where did you go to study over overseas? And how many years? Uh, I went to study in, um, I studied with the Mauritanian shiuch um, in the system. Alhamdulillah, I studied for about, uh, altogether about eight or nine years. Um, with the Mauritanian shiuch um, in uh, Mauritania and also in other places. Um, but uh, uh, I spent about four and a half years in West Africa and Mauritania in the Mashallah. desert. So you were, you're, you're, you're basically, your, your knowledge, your lineage of knowledge goes back to Mauritania. To Mauritania, specifically to Murabat al Hajj, Rahimahullah, and his students. MashaAllah. And your father, you were talking about your father. Where are your parents from? My father, um, uh, Dr. Salam Ansur, he's from Jordan, 
Uh, he was born uh, in Jordan. He came to the U.S. for graduate studies. That's where he met my mother. Uh, she was from Mississippi. And uh, her family background, they're, they're Irish Catholic. She later converted to Islam, but uh, they met on a picket line uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. She was part of the, um, uh, the, 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 the migrant farmers, workers' rights, the United Farm Workers, which started out here in California under Cesar Chavez. Uh, they were doing a number of, of strikes against certain produce to get more rights for the migrant farmers, farm workers. Um, and they met on a, a picket line in Jackson, Mississippi. Then they moved back to Jordan, and that's where I was. Uh, that's where I was born. And then you have, Irish, you have Irish in you. You have Jordanian. I, I'm sure it goes back to Palestine somehow. You know. Uh, yeah, about 350 years ago. So my father, um, uh, the the Khalil al Nisr, who's the my ninth grandfather, came from uh, Hebron, Khalil. Uh, in Palestine, and before that, Libya, and then Morocco, uh, uh, back to Morocco. Uh, but my father, for their family, for hundreds of years, have been in Jordan. And yes, on my mother's side of the family, they're Hogan's, they're Irish. So I always joke with people. I say, when you take uh, Jordanian blood and Irish blood from Mississippi, and you know, let it marinate in Mississippi, you get somebody who's um, a very interesting person. I, I definitely think it is. Uh, always, always ready for a fight. Law-abiding citizen. But, you know, definitely like a good um, confrontation. If, if the product is something like this, I will encourage more Jordanians to marry Irish women. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if this is the if this is a product, next time someone comes up to me, Sheikh I'm Jordan, I found a girl who's Caucasian background, Irish. Let's do it. Get the two witnesses, figure it out now. Uh, but if this is, if this is the, the, the dynamic product of, the family that you come from, your mother converted to Islam, your father, Rahmatullah you told me he was a sheikh. He was, your, of course, your teacher. And um, I can I can see the way you were talking about your dad. Um, such a great person he was. May Allah give him the highest level in Jannah. I mean, I mean. And um, so you, are you married and have children? I'm sorry to ask you such a yeah. question. No, no, no worries. Actually, you know, I was going to say, um, uh, I was watching how you, you're you handling this. You would be a great... I hope I hope this is a podcast or, or a show, but you you really know how to um, uh, to to handle the show. So it's 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 good. I hope you have more shows and uh, and bring and it's good. It's like a it's it's bringing khair, You know, there's plenty of podcasts and 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 and, and live shows about other things, but uh, you're 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 talking about khair. Uh Yes, my wife actually is from Michigan. Uh, from Bloomfield Hills, and um, so I'm actually out there in Michigan quite often. Um, and uh, we're uh, we're married. We have three kids: uh, twelve, eight, and four. Mashallah, Mashallah. And the names of your kids? Uh, my daughter is Sumeya. Then mashallah. my son is Malik, and then my youngest son is Hassan. Mashallah, you got the beautiful names. I have a son named Hassan also. Oh, yeah? Sumeya, beautiful name. Malik's beautiful name also. Now you, you you said your in laws are in Michigan. So it's not hard for me to get you to come here because all I have to do is no, not at all. Yeah, I was at we were actually out there uh, in August just a couple of months ago. Alhamdulillah. I, now you're you're a neighbor to us. You know, you're Ni'mal yeah. John. You're you're a neighbor I to actually, us. You know, I was uh, there's a podcast I was speaking with Muhi Khawaja. You might know him uh, or know him. He has an American Muslim Fund. But I was talking to him on his podcast a couple of months ago, um, and I said, I you know, if you look at a lot of the khair that's happening, a lot of the um, not just khair, but specifically um, uh, initiatives, new initiatives that are happening. There's like certain pockets in the U.S. where you see a lot of things happening. And one of them is Michigan. Like there's a lot of amazing things that come out of Michigan specifically. We know Chicago, Sharif, you know, that exists and they have a lot. But Michigan has a lot of and there's a lot of people who are doing things in other parts of the U.S. that, that um, uh, So Michigan is definitely one of the um, um qura for the Muslims in the U.S. I mean, may Allah keep it like that. May Allah continue to take work from everyone wherever they are. So I want to keep you on forever because you speak so well. You're always smiling and you're half Irish and half Jordanian. You know, that that, that whole mixture. Keep me, now I, I want to talk to you even more. But um, the work that you're doing is the most important thing that I, I learned today. And um, I want to thank Sheikh Abdul Wahab. If Sheikh Abdul Wahab can sneak onto the screen for a second. Um, I want to also say my brother really speaks highly of you. And um, he's the one that... Salam Abdul Wahab. Alhamdulillah, Bajan. Sheikh, um, Rami, how are you? Jazakallah khair. I was, Bajan, I was here the whole time just listening and enjoying your guys' discussion. Um, thank you for inviting me. Not at all, Sheikh. I'm I'm honor. Honor. I, Sheikh, I apologize. I wasn't on. You know, I would have been on if I was feeling more comfortable, but I think Sheikh Abdullah knows how to hold the mic and, and take care of business. So, Miller, Miller, reward him. 
I have to do it because you don't want to do it anymore. And, and, no, no, and I'm, good, man. I'm, I'm enjoying watching and taking notes. It was a very, very informative session. Sheikh, one of the reasons why we do this is to bring different mashayikh on from different parts of the country or the world that are doing different services of, of deen and to show our entire audience that is watching that we don't all have to be the same doing the same work as long as we have the same objective. And mashallah, uh, you know, you're doing, you're, you're an example of that. And hopefully we see you in Michigan soon. Yeah, I look forward to coming out there and seeing the wonderful work. Actually, one of my, my students is, is one of your students out there now uh, at the boarding school. I think he was at the boarding school now. He's, uh, but, uh, Zakaria. Zakaria. Yeah. yeah. He's, still, yeah. he's still in the boarding school. He's the, he he is. Was, yeah. His mother moved here, for, but he, he wanted to stay in the boarding school. Oh, so, wow. Um, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. I heard from you know from him and and uh, you know so many great things and I didn't know the extent of of the of the awesome work that, that you're doing so. Uh, for, for the audience, Sheikh Rami is actually going to be holding our Saturday class next week, the one that we have every Saturday between three to five. Inshallah, Sheikh Rami will be holding one next week. This week we have one as well, and you can sign up on our website. Inshallah, it's obviously the classes are free. Uh, you're more than welcome to sign. Sheikh Rami, Sheikh Rami, this class is going to be on the same topic. Uh, it's going to be on a similar topic, very similar topic. Oh, excellent. So, and that's perfect time for the audience to learn. But I also want to um, just update the audience that's watching the viewers about our Sira Intensive. Sira Intensive, inshallah, on December 20th to December 26th, we'll have it on site, in person, 100 spots, limited spots, and they're almost filling up now already. Um, I'm, Mufti Dohab, I'm, I'm asking Mufti Dohab to open the space to 150, and there's space for 500 in this hall. Um, but because of COVID, we're going to limit it to 100, 150. So please, if you're interested in coming in person in Michigan uh, in the beautiful winter, but inside it will be nice and cozy and we'll be talking about the Prophet on Sira, please join us for the Sira Intensive. If you are um, outside of the state or you're far away from us and you can't make it because of the circumstances, this is the first time we'll be also hosting it online. So you and your family, from the comfort of your homes, can watch and learn about the seed of the Prophet, especially with all that's going on in the world. You know, and, and this is the best time for us and our children to reestablish our relationship with the Prophet. So please sign up. The, the link was shared, and inshallah, that can also benefit you and your family. Sheikh Rami, Jen, before, before we leave, Bajan, I would like to tell everyone to support the Aiba Foundation as well. Um, obviously, the great work that Sheikh Rami is doing, I've shared it a few times. Yeah. I'm, I'm only back to tell people that support the Labor Foundation, become a Labor sustainer as well. Um, you know, and inshallah, uh, hopefully, we will get a hand in the great work that they're doing and get some Sadaqah Jariya as well. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we'll support your organization, inshallah. We love the name, it's from the city of the Prophet's name, and Taiba. And it's also the work of the Prophet. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Keep us in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa